Hey everyone, this is Tom, and this week's uh, episode of, or issue, or whatever, of R&D Fantasy was drawn by guest artist Matt Rhodes, who is sitting here beside me, and he's going to take the reins and talk about what he did for Taylor. Hey, thanks. Yeah, well, uh, this was a really, uh, it was a real treat. I Tom was uh, telling me about one of the upcoming characters he had. I think it was Raleigh with... Um, pirate Rasputin Cthulhu worshipping and I just <laughs> I started getting so jealous and I thought oh that sounds like fun I should do one of those and thankfully Tom said really you want to yeah. and uh so yeah it, it's cool to thanks for the opportunity to do it no problem um, it's nice to take a break uh <laughs> but it's also nice to I mean I, I, I would love to have other artists step in every once in a while and have a lot of different like special episodes and, and that whatever, would be cool but, uh, well, it was it's intimidating because you've already set a pretty good precedent for these things. They've all turned out really well. Thanks. Um, so for mine, I got Clara Leone, yeah. uh, Taylor's character, and um, yeah, it was it was a cool challenge. So um, it's pretty a pretty young character, eighteen, um, a ranger, which is my class of choice if I can go for it. Ranger, I'll definitely do that with a little bit of rogue thrown in there. And um, yeah, it was cool. I, this is <laughs> here's one of the things I already like about what you're doing on R and D fantasy is that it's it's like a best practices uh, approach. So there are all these shortcuts that you eventually take and ways that you go about doing stuff that um, that you can just kind of get into some bad habits. And with R the R and D fantasy stuff, you're kind of it looks like you're kind of going the long way around yeah. with everything. Um, which is good. It's, you know, just going with pose and building things up into uh, the bone structure and musculature. And when I show people what you're doing, they're just, <gasps> oh my goodness. Well, it forces, I don't know, it's nice having just being forced to do it. And yeah, it, it helps. Yeah, having it's a. It's kind of worth it. I mean, a big part of this is just practice. That's uh, exactly it, yeah. And, you know, if I can just take the long way every time, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the more you sweat in boot camp the less you bleed in battle like that kind of thing that's a good way of putting so it. if i can just get better than rather than just sitting around at home I, I, that's kind of my goal <laughs> yeah yeah well no it's working like they're they're turning out really well thank you so for my like i said this was part of the intimidation factor is coming in um i i kind of went with a hybrid technique where i was kind of copying how a little bit of your approach but also kind of just leaning on a lot of the things that I've I've learned to come at it. So Good. starting off even with this, writing out the um, uh, just the, the descriptions for everything. Uh, it's something I remember. I was like, I think it was the Jim Lee or Jim Henson's company, where they had a rule that you didn't put pencil to paper with the design until you had figured out exactly who the character was. Mm. Uh, so you're writing everything out. You write down the histories and details and everything that you know. Um, before you actually start drawing and that just, that makes all the difference. Yeah. Uh, to me, it, it's at its best when you know all of the details about a character so that you kind of have no choice in what you're drawing, or at least it should feel that way. Mm -hmm. That one, once you even just come to the first thumbnails, it should just be just execution. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the best spot to be is when you feel like it's just a matter of like, well, they've got red boots, they've got... You know long hair or chin length hair you know mm -hmm. you can just put it in but then you put it in based on research and design and what's going to work and like a character like this even though they've got hair this long or this color mm -hmm. it's probably they're probably going to manifest it this way by how they cut it because of their station in life or you yeah. know that sort of stuff but well it's kind of like a little mini version of uh like one thing that's great at doing concept art is that we can fail on paper we can try something, and if it doesn't work, yeah. we know that very quickly. In a way, writing it down before you even get to the concept art is failing on paper before you fail on paper. You can kind of feel it out, see if it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even if the description is weird, like with your imagination, you'd be able to know if certain things are clashing or they're yeah. inconsistent or contradictory. So writing this out... Um, writing out some of the details about uh, the character's past and some of their physical details and, and, and you know, artifacts and, and various other things. Um, what I'm, the big advantage to this for me is figuring out uh, a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's figuring out, 
because really if you could you could write out a big long description and do everything um but you kind of want to figure out um to me anyway like what what's the main point you want what's the main read you want to get off of this character yeah and then the secondary and the tertiary and by about then you're not really that worried but you're trying to use all of the different graphic design rules to uh to to keep that focus on your main main thing in yeah. the lyric. Well, so this I just I, I just took a, a screenshot of my sketchbook or yeah, a photo of my sketchbook. sketchbook. Notes before. Yeah, as I was reading through um, Taylor's description of Clara, I, I would just think through kind of what some of the art objects would be. So super super rough, and I just kind of kept that yeah off to the side. Yeah, I sometimes do that sort of doodling just on the bus where I'm like oh, I need to figure out like this jacket or some sort of weird shape, mm -hmm. and I've got some time, so just do a quick little squiggle. Well, I, I, I keep a little sketchbook right here. It's, it, I keep it with me that um, it's it has no pretty drawings in it whatsoever. It's full of just <laughs> yeah. that stuff where it's it's purely just visual notes. Yeah, it's notes. It's not even sketches anymore. Yeah, there's there's no point in anybody looking at it because I, I take everything from this little book and I put it into a painting on the computer or, or a bigger drawing in a, in a larger sketchbook. Yeah. Uh, I just remembered something about what you did here mm. is... Uh, I let you. I left you to it. I came home, and you were done after just a couple hours. I'm normally spending like I try. I do try to get it done as fast as I can. Usually winds up being between six to nine hours or, or mm -hmm. whatever. But you were done in was it two and two a and half, half? Two and a half. Okay, so just so everybody knows, somebody might have noticed that like the strokes are kind of landing at a pretty normal speed. I mean, still quickly, <laughs> but um, so anyway, so it, this video is real time. this video is sped up to two hours. <laughs> uh, so we trimmed a half an hour trimming, off. So, so Matt works fast, he works hard, and he gets to the point. Um, but yeah, so that's why everything's kind of laying out, like all the writing and stuff, like normally. I, I, but this is, yeah, this is a good a, a good point to talk about early. Um, is uh, just the, the difference in, in working styles between what you're trying to accomplish with yours and what I'm used to doing. Yeah. Um, so the, the previous R&D, the, the, the portraits and characters that you've done so far, are really illustration. Yes, yeah. Uh, where the image is the art. The image is the object. It's the um, the desired result is the image, basically. Yeah. Uh, which is awesome. I, I, I love illustration. I, I So my favorite artists are illustrators, and, mm -hmm. and it's something that periodically I'll do. Yeah. Um, but I've now... Actually, I got my 10-year award this Christmas, so I've, uh, I've been doing concept art officially for 10 years. Nice. Um, but that's meant that, that my mentality for all that time has been that the, the art, the finished product is a video game yeah. or is, you know, a, a, for other people it's film or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, my work is, is more of a tool to get you there. Yeah. And so, um, so all of these techniques that, that I'm using here are things that I've learned over the years that just work for me to move really, really fast. Um, you yeah. know, I, realizing it now, what I almost should have done, if I had more, I mean, really part of it was I, I didn't have as much time to do it, but what I should have done was taken the same amount of time you spend on one and gone through the iteration process, uh, where it's like the reason I work fast mm. is because I want to do one version, bring it to all the people who have a say in it, yeah. get their feedback, and then do another version and and not spend too much time going through those iterations yeah yeah like i'm spending like a, a full working day on the thing exactly and it's like yeah yeah like what i'm doing like i mean and you'll definitely be around for more i'm sure so don't worry about oh, that yeah. we'll yeah. have a chance for that but um what you're doing is a definitely like pure concept art this is like oh, yeah. production yeah. pipeline <clears throat> like we need this out the door like we've got a meeting tomorrow <clears throat> or like let's just get this fig character figured out and like what i'm doing it involves the conceptualization process but it is more, like, I don't want to give people the wrong impression. Like, what you're doing here is concept art. What I'm doing is, like... It's illustration. It, it is illustration, yeah. yes. But it is, like, it involves what I've learned doing concept art. For, for well, I guess it's it's kind of a hybrid. Because sometimes when I think, especially, like, fantasy illustration can often be um, just rendered. Yeah. And not always that well designed. Yeah. But you're doing both simultaneously. You're you're designing. You're going through the right process and building things up. There is a conceptualization and design process. Yeah. And you're really leaning on visual storytelling. Um, it's just you're bringing it to that level of render that. Yeah, I wanted it to be something that people could, when they get it, they can like print it off with their sheet or, you know, like yeah, you know, it could 
something that looks like it like it would be their character, but it mm-hmm. looks like something that could be from a player's handbook or something. When that character dies, they can frame it and light candles beside it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, that's I mean that's one of the reasons why I want to get you and any any other concept artists that would be interested in yeah. doing this, so that people can see different techniques. Like even me, like I yeah. each one of my videos, I go about things differently. Like I don't have a. This is your line layer. This is your skin layer. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm narrowing down to something like that yeah. as I like refine things. But um, I want, like, I want to explore different stuff, and I want people to come on and show how they do stuff, and I want to see how you do stuff. And yeah. like, I would be so cool to see. Like, I mean, we'll have to get like somebody to play art director though. If you do do the <laughs> big, like, a bunch of iterations, like, yeah. see like. Okay, that works, day, that doesn't like, work, yeah. Yeah, like, let's push it this way. It's like, oh, I'm too wood elf, not enough barn owl. Yeah, yeah exactly. whatever. Um, More barn owl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's, a, that's just an old uh, uh, illustrator's uh, trick. It's just more barn owl. Mm-hmm. Something's mm-hmm. not working. That's a classic. Yeah. Um, the drawing, it's uh, already up to the sketch layer number two. Um, not that I actually officially number them, but uh, what, I w- what I was doing, actually, I was going to mention it when it was happening, yeah, but do that, not that yeah. far away, was... Um, at work, we've been kind of going through these uh, these online classes, uh, which I should look up the name of. Uh, one of the other guys runs it, but it's um, kind of a Pixar drawing course thing. Mm. And so we've been really going back to the fundamentals and doing um, life drawing, but, but going through the most basic exercises, like don't draw the figure, just draw the line of action. Mm, yeah. Um, doing that kind of stuff, which can be infuriating because you feel like, oh, I should know this stuff already. But then you realize, oh, yeah, no, I have totally forgotten all this stuff. Oh, yeah, and yeah. I'm not relying on it. And actually looking at this now, I put in that line of action. I was trying to go for the, the pose for this character of being yeah. kind of proud and standoffish. She's a bit, you know, she's uh, she holds her head high, but she doesn't want anything to do with most people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think my structural drawing here follows that line enough. Hmm. I think this is... I think that's normal, though. I th- like, that happens to me, too. Whenever yeah. I do my pose, like, the, my initial, like, drawing of the figure, and then I do the anatomy stuff, there's still something missing. That's one. That's something I'm, I'm really wor- trying to work towards fixing by the time I'm done all this. Yeah. But I think it's because when you have a simpler line, your imagination fills in the details and connects it to what you want it to be a mm-hmm. lot quicker. It's kind of like, um, like hiding in the sketchiness. Where it's like you have like a loose figure drawing and it yeah. looks awesome, but the sec- but once you finish inking it, it just looks so stale and terrible because now it's like you've really put it down. Like the line mm-hmm. is like the line must be drawn here and oh, no yeah. further. And but but so like yeah, when you have the one gestural thing, like you can see it, you can feel it, but then to actually build on it is like to get that to connect mm-hmm. is a whole different. Ever kind since of thing. actually, I, had, I should tell it. Ever since high school, I had this one art teacher who I, I had recently saw, uh, looked at some illustrations when I was probably in grade 10 or so yeah. of Glenn Keane's drawings and yeah. some of his really loose gestural ones. And I loved that look and I started trying to do it and I would draw all these you know, big lines and messy shapes and stuff like that. And I had one art teacher that said, okay, which line should I look at? Like, which one is which one is the right line? I was like, oh, you need some I ice just, for that burn. I know. I was, <laughs> I, I, and that that haunted me. That somehow stuck. And so I've hmm. I've made an attempt to keep my lines as clean and precise, so that as I'm learning, I I make a choice, and if it's not the right choice, I can see it right away. There's mm. there's not as much hiding in it. That's one um, thing. Like when I first got into art school, it's like I kind of noticed that like I was hiding in the sketches. Like that's mm-hmm. why I started drawing with pen, and, like ballpoint right, pen, yeah, and ink yeah. pen, because then it was like you need, I needed to start drawing more deliberately mm-hmm. and getting to that line sooner. Because if yeah. I just if you just cloud things in and just whiff whiff yeah. whiff, yeah, it, you don't learn as much as you go. You, you kind of find that line by accident. Here's a stupid little side note. I on the face, um, I draw. I've been starting to draw this trapezoid. Mm. Um, this is an attempt to keep myself reined in, um, because I typically, I, I love drawing the face and I tend to increase the, like the facial features are big mm. and that's what l- it tends to give me a lot of comments about my stuff being cartoony and, and stuff like that, which mm. I fully accept stylized. That's fine. Whatever. But the, the trapezoid, it's like, you know, it keeps, I, and I'm, look, I'm, even the eyes are starting to escape it. I, I, can, <laughs> yeah. I can barely hold They're it. They're a little high. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, it at least keeps them sort of within this range. So the eyes are there, the mouth is, mouth is at the bottom. Because um, if I don't do that, like, my noses get out of whack and it just, yeah. uh, they get huge. My eyes, I love making them big and wide. And, mm-hmm. 
all these little things that you start learning it about yourself that you try to account for. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff like that, like as a concept artist, where you can draw it and you can see it and you know exactly who this character is and what their face is structured, but then when you pass it off to a, a, a 3D modeler, they have a much more difficult time actually cramming certain things onto a realistically proportioned body now, like that, as they kind of translate what you've done mm -hmm. stylistically. Um, and then they might be able to fit all the parts in, but it doesn't have that same character yeah. that you had before. And so I love the idea of concept art with style and personality to it, uh, and it should be done that way. But to be able to rein it into the point where you can, where you're actually successfully communicating, yeah, a better idea of what it's going to look like. Uh, well, and, that, and that's I've I know for sure the way that I draw has been completely changed, and like the trajectory of it has been changed by working specifically at Bioware. Because we make games that are intentionally within that believable space. Mm. I wouldn't say realistic, but you know, it's like they're kind of going for that. Um, and yeah, like in working with modelers and stuff like that, being able to 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 draw in proportions that you at least know are going to translate yeah. fairly well. Yeah. Um, and the the three D process always kind of. I mean, it's it's amazing what some of these sculptors can do. Because it's not an easy thing to go from somebody else's two D drawing into a three D. Yeah. Uh, 3D object, but um, yeah, being able to draw at least somewhat accurately, like I, I think a lot of, because working in line work, it's almost literally like I'm using blueprints mm. uh, to try to explain my intention, but sometimes too, I, I use exaggeration and, and kind of lean a little harder on the style when I know I want to get something in the model. I purposely have to draw it farther than I know it's going to end up mm. in order to get it roughly where I'd like it I see what you mean, to yeah. go. Yeah, like if you have like shoulder pads that you just need to look really pointy. Yeah. If you did draw them just square, like a Bruce Tim drawing, they would Ooh. just think you were just drawing square shoulders, like a normal like suit jacket yeah. kind of shoulders. But if you wanted them to actually be a pronounced spike, you'd have to really like you pull it out really like, far. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> like a glam rock kind yeah. of costume thing. Exactly. Um, so with Clara here, I was I was trying to draw a draw a hair on her that looked. Um, like she wasn't that bothered by it. She doesn't spend her time around a lot of people, um, or at least the main thrust of her. She she's she's pretty socially awkward, and spends a lot of her time out in the forest. And so doing her hair is not a huge concern. And then giving her kind of the the bangs over the or the 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 long hair over the face as that kind of protective layer, um, which I realized was also what they did in The Incredibles with Violet. Mm. Um, you just having that veil over her over mm -hmm. her character uh, that she can hide behind. That's one thing that's good about getting as much information as like, as you see that we do uh, from the character, or from the person who created the character, so that the more they can tell you about the character, the more you can see stuff like that mm -hmm. as like an opportunity to like put character in there. Like The way that people behave is pretty consistent, depending yeah. on who they are and what they've been through. And mm -hmm. things like body language and posture and how they dress and how they do their hair and carry themselves or hide their features and stuff. It's like there's subconscious stuff in there that can come through and having like that kind of closed off yeah, like hair in the front of the face kind of thing. I mean, it's not a surprise that you see a lot of teenagers <laughs> like with <laughs> hair in like over their face, you know? Yeah. So this, this, at this stage I was kind of wrestling a lot with, um, uh, with her statistics. So she had, uh, um, Taylor had specified that Clara was 110 pounds mm -hmm. and five foot four, so she's a fairly like you know average-ish height for uh, an 18 year old, but 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 fairly lightweight. And yeah. so I kept stra you know trying to balance that out between someone who runs around with short swords and can you know pull a, pull a bow and arrow yeah uh, on a regular basis, but is also still pretty slim. Mm -hmm. and small so yeah I tried to keep the head still a little on the bigger side just because 18 is still pretty young yeah um yeah well, well I remember like when I was in grade like starting grade 10 and I saw the people in grade 12 I thought they looked like 30 <laughs> yeah and now when I'm on the bus on the ride home and precious, I'm like leaving work early and then I see 18 year old and it's babies. like yeah like a bunch of 18 year olds get on the bus it's like does daycare get out this early? <laughs> it's crazy. It's yep. just part of getting older, I guess. But but yeah, finding ways to 
justify what the character is capable of versus how their body is described mm-hmm. can be challenging, especially if, if these are characters that have like 18 strength, which is exactly. really high, but they're like a 5'2", 105 pound like person yeah. or w- of whatever gender, you know, like that's, is there's got to be magic involved somewhere <laughs> if that's going to be happening or, or, yeah. or something, but because you want to have it, you want to be able to look at the character and tell stuff about them and like see it on them, even if it's hidden, you know. Well, that's, and we've talked about this before, but that, and I, and maybe you've even mentioned this in a previous, uh, previous video, but, um, the, the thing that I get really excited about and that, that it makes me love this is like, you're trying to simulate, uh, the Sherlock Holmes <laughs> yeah. analysis process <laughs> yeah. where people should be able to look at the character and even if they're not actively doing it, they should be able to start picking out pieces and let it tell them stories until they just know Mm-hmm. information about the character without having to be told yeah yeah like red letter media it's you may not have noticed but your brain did yeah i think yeah i mean it, it opens up such a like a heavy kind of topic where it's like people like people mm-hmm. and people like characters that feel like real people you know whenever a character is people is is well loved it's because they're performed well they were written well yeah um and they're they the, the the successful characters are the ones that feel like real people yeah and the ones that feel like real people are the ones that are like us and the ones that are like us are relatable and there needs to be stuff about them visually just because people are visual and relate visually in ways it's like it's, it's something that I've, I've thought about a lot on the bus and i get it in my brain but to be able to explain it is different, where it's like, um, in order to sort of live up to what the character is on the inside, you need to try to embellish them as much as a real person would be on the outside, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And so you're kind of like, the the character's appearance is sort of like a business card for them, where yeah. now somebody can watch a trailer or look at a poster or a game cover, and, they're, and they can connect with the character in some way. At least that's the hope. Yeah. Like now there's enough there where it's like you can see that it's a person, it's not just a character. Yeah, the um I mean that would well, be like best case scenario. Like that's yeah, the dream. Yeah, I think you what know. what you're going for ideally with every character design is that um as an artist, you get out of the way. Yeah. That um when when people look at the character, they're just seeing the character. And it's not so much the artist saying, look at me, look at me, look how cool this is. Um, but it's just, it's just true. Um, yeah, the, I, I've been, for, <laughs> for a while I was saying truthiness, but I've learned verisimilitude. We actually had a word for that. Um, oh. <laughs> veris, verisimilitude is, <laughs> okay. is truthiness. Um, that uh, even drawing through this stuff and drawing, you know, hairstyle choices and clothing choices and even just what the what the body is, that um, you try to be almost as... You're using all of the things that you know, and as an artist, you're bringing whatever the wealth of knowledge and research and inspiration you have to the table. But what you're really trying to just do is be as honest to this character as you can. Yeah. Um, trying to get out of their way so that they can just appear... Yeah. It's what I, I tend to get, and I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know, I get, uh, I get pretty passionate about character designs and when people, uh, critique, I mean, even just, I was, I think I saw a redesign of Venom mm. from, uh, from one of the comics and, and people were critiquing it and well, not even critiquing it, just making fun of it and saying, that's not Venom, but it's like, wait, 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 you, you don't know the story yet. Yeah. I don't know the story yet, but let's wait and see what the context is. Why he looks this way. Because it might make 100% sense. Yeah. It might make total sense. And you would be like, he couldn't look like anything else. Yeah. Um, and really, that's the other word that I've become fond of is, is um, uh, immutable. And I've been using it way too much lately. But, but that you want a character design to be immutable. That if you, if you, it can't be reduced. That you couldn't add to it or take away from it that much yeah. without it requiring explanation or or without changing Mm. things too much that um Mm. especially 
the big challenge, and I even just did it today. I looked at some costumes I was doing for work and realized that they had totally gotten out of hand with detail. Yeah. And so I had to go in and start trimming yeah. Um, yeah. and pulling things out because things just weren't necessary. They were just distracting and, and, and not, not adding to... Um, they were really getting in the way and saying like, oh, look at all this cool stuff we can design rather than it being what these characters would actually create for themselves. I think that's a really scary threshold for hopeful concept artists and young concept artists is like, when do you stop? Like mm. when do you stop putting in detail? It's like you look at anybody on the street, <clears throat> they're just wearing a jacket. Mm -hmm. Just wearing, they're just wearing blue pants. Like Han Solo's just got a vest and yeah, boots. Yeah, like if you that. didn't, if you weren't used to it, the fact that everybody wears like these really blue pants all the time, like that's a, yep. it looks silly, like it looks <clears> like a cartoon, <throat> but like being able to like just stop on a design and say, "Yep, yeah, that's them, that's mm -hmm. it right there." Like you don't have to like carve amazing patterns into leather or like yeah. have like demon heads and skulls shooting out of shoulder pads and scars on every character's face and just just letting them be that like just let their jacket be their jacket don't try to find places to put detail where it doesn't need to be well yeah my my own personal um not even rule it's just how what i what my preference is is that i stop when you get Mm -hmm. That like if if as I'm drawing along once it's at the point where I could show it to somebody and they get what I'm trying to say Even if it's not totally rendered even if the drawings not finished, but we all understand right? Mm -hmm. That's when I'm done yeah. um, And that's when I can move on to the next thing or, or you know, we can have a little discussion about it and I can try again um, yeah. yeah Well at any time in the process you can always add something new to a character like oh, yeah. I need some more oh, detail yeah. on this or whatever but to be able to just at the most succinct level just put that character out there like mm -hmm. that's a great target to be because then as long as you can get the idea across then you can instantly start on different iterations yeah and getting yeah. going up to through the approval process and then whatever yeah um so what's what's so we got some costume stuff yeah so i i started with um every good ranger needs a, a nice outdoor coat something nice and long and and cozy with a hood when it starts to rain yeah um, and I was thinking she comes from nobility. So the idea like she would have this thing it would be built for her um, It's it's tailored for her and then over top of one arm one of the great things about her backstory is that her family are She comes from a wood elf family being a wood elf, um, but they raise griffins so I was thinking about these griffin handlers and uh, you get you know people who are into falconry um, have these big long shoulder length gloves that they use to hold out so that the griffins can land on them and they can feed them and send them off mm. without getting torn to shreds and i was just thinking that would be great you know you have these griffins coming up and you need at least a little bit of defense or just to be able to put your arm there just to keep them from yeah, like happy uh, dogs kind of yeah exactly up. and for falcons you just need a layer of leather but with griffins it's reinforced i've added a second layer of much thicker leather bolted on yeah. um, and also trying to get that just the that repeated form uh, echoing uh like a, a falcon or an, or an eagle's leg yeah trying to copy a bit of that so it looks a little bit like a griffin's leg. Yeah. And it's also providing extra protection. Well, I'd imagine even, like, if a griffin did have eagle talons out front, um, it would just be a good design sense as far as a creature goes that, like, that's how the claws, like, that's how you would be defended from another griffin's claws would be if you had that kind of armor. So then that kind of design would be good to use for the arms of something that deals with yeah. something with talons. Yeah, exactly. I also, um, when you first described it to me, I, I, it made me think of, like, those video or those pictures of, like, the people feeding the baby birds with the fake <laughs> mama bird head. Or, like, something yeah, that right. they, they can kind of reach into the cage and not spook the babies, yeah, yeah. like, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, Put some claws on your fingertips and yeah. drop in some mice. <laughs> yeah, that would actually work, too. Well, what I did on the, on the end there, um, one of the notes, and I, I wrote it down, so it's, we've probably already, we've passed it, but, um, yeah, it's fine. was that this, she has uh, pretty high dexterity. And so thinking with these leather gloves that she would have, like she's chopped off these fingers um, just for extra little, uh, just a little bit more movement. Mm -hmm. And then it was a good chance to get uh, the, a family, a family ring in there. Mm. Uh, just, she comes from a noble family. So the idea, like she hasn't left the family, she's just off on her own. So um, 
He's got yeah. that big signet. Just yeah, the big it. signet ring on her finger, um, and that when I detail it up, I added just a little, uh, uh, kind of an, a really simple tree motif. Just um, and then this part too, I, I was trying to think um, in just a few layers, like, and I really just have two layers. I have the coat and then what's underneath. And uh, I was thinking of being a ranger and being out in the wild. And part of Clara's backstory is that uh, at one point her mother just starts completely acting unlike herself and starts like actually like getting really physically dangerous around like her father and all these other characters. And it's part of what inspires her to leave uh, her to leave home because it's just it, it's not feeling safe. And so um, I, I kind of like this idea that you know she was before this even she was reclusive and she would go out and and, and spend way more time in the wilderness. Then she went at home, and when her mother was still herself, the idea that you know she has this daughter that she loves and and uh, it just it doesn't have a, that strong of a connection to, but she's kind of always worrying about her and thinking about her. And so I know, like my mom, well, our mom, uh, you know, she knit my my daughter's blankets and toques and yeah. scarves, and they're these precious kind of keepsakes, and so. Um, the idea that she would have knit her this warm sweater for all this time that she spends out rangering and hunting um and that it's become something somewhat precious to her that uh that it, it, yeah and that she keeps it with her and it's it's a it's the memory of what her mother was yeah. and a reminder of what she would like to get her back to is uh is this loving mother that um yeah so just trying to Keep that as a reminder. That's one of those things that I like doing too. Is is um, finding those details that are so ingrained in the story that that wrap themselves up in the story that at first read it might just oh it's a sweater. Yeah. Um, but when you learn her backstory and you get into some of the more the reasons behind it, suddenly you you like you never look at it the same way again. Yeah. That that you know you watch it you watch things a second time and it's just. <sighs> Oh man, you, it was you, there the whole time. Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of like the coolest things that can happen. Is like it's so satisfying. Yeah. yeah, like when you can have something in there and then you'd never notice it before, but then you realize it that like it was there on purpose and it represented this the whole time, and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's just so cool to be able to do that. Like Nick Thornborough hanging a wolf's jawbone off of the neck of Solus in Dragon Age Inquisition, which for anyone who's played it all the way to the end is just. Beautiful. Yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been out long enough. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so just detailing up, drawing up. This is, you know, just kind of loosely trying to... A lot of this is me just exploring, trying to figure out where things are going to go. I was thinking she would have requested all of these additional pockets on this thing just because, you know, you're spending a lot of time out in the wilderness. She's collecting mushrooms and nuts and moss for starting fires and she just you know needs a place to keep all of this stuff mm -hmm. yeah that's one thing that um i've included a couple times but i kind of i wish i could do more of it but it can just be too much is like equipping the characters with all their gear yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think uh moving forward you know we've all seen enough bed rolls <laughs> kind of know like what they have on them uh -huh. you know you start off with the just the adventurers kit you know you kind of assume it's sort of there it's it's sort of there as a technicality so i kind of just i'm not i'm not gonna draw it much anymore i think just like weapons and <clears throat> gear and shields and you know mm -hmm. certain certain like sp things that are specific to the character i'll probably include yeah but things like making sure they've got enough pouches for stuff. I mean, as long as they look like they can kind of do what they are meant to do. Like, if they're a thief, more pockets, more bags. Well, this is this is one of the great questions, too, about when you're thinking about character design. And knowing as much as you can about them is that, you know, um, there are so many economic questions. But even that one where it's like, how far away from their home base are they? Yeah. You know, are they operating out of, are they, you know, a thief in a town in which they have a hovel nearby? Mm-hmm. Or is this, you know, Frodo and Sam at the very end of their thousands of miles of walking? Yeah. And, you know, how, how how far away from them and how well equipped? How, how far from resupply are they? And, yeah. And that kind of thing. Yeah, how much can they leave? How much can they... Like, are they a local? They can leave all their heavy yeah. stuff there. 
It's it's kind of amazing that backpacks haven't become just more of a standard. See them on everything, on everybody fantasy trope or video game trope or just anything. Mm-hmm. Like you just really because there's always so much gear. There's always so much stuff. It's like backpacks should just almost be automatic. <laughs> and just you have to specify. Oh, this character doesn't have one. Yeah. It it yeah. It's it's weird. Like even like in Skyrim and stuff and. Yeah. Well, there's there are a lot of jokes in the '90s about like the heroes of first-person shooters having tons of guns. Mm-hmm. And, like, where are they keeping them? They've yeah. got like at least ten guns, and then where do they go? But then, I... if if you're like if you're cramming tons of stuff in Skyrim into a backpack, and it's not realistic, you may as well just not have a backpack. Well, yeah, I know. There's I know. lines. There's I lines. I like this idea for the cape. I can't. This was. Um, Tom mentioned this idea before I started drawing, and I just thought, damn it, that's good. Um, what do you call the, the ring? A torque. A torque. Okay. So the metal ring around the neck, the torque, and the cape hangs off of that. And I just thought that was so good, because this cape comes from, um, it's it was a gift from mountain gods. And so it's it, I wanted to seem a little bit out of out of the ordinary, and, and, and like it follows different rules, which my idea for it was just not that interesting um but but tom thought of that and he mentioned it for me and i just said yeah absolutely that's what's happening history um, to the rescue absolutely that's where research <laughs> research comes in handy every time yeah oh yeah because our own brains are so limited our memories and our own experiences they just they're not enough even like coming up with something new i mean People have big, heavy conversations about, like, what is creativity and stuff, but I find in concept art, it's better to just think of what you do as being clever, or not creative, but just, like, a lot of it is jokes, a lot of it is sarcastic choices, and <laughs> for the most part, a lot a lot of it is just cobbling together parts from nature or history or modern-day reality and then just stylizing it and like making it look like it fits into the world and then setting there you go rather than inventing something completely new yeah yeah, yeah. well part part of the fun actually i just only this is the first time i've thought about this but is that a lot part of the fun of of just designing and character design it's almost like going through the visual thesaurus mm. and it's like cape yes we've seen a cape before but you do research into the visual thesaurus which is everything yeah and you find a whole bunch of other visual words for cape like i hadn't heard of torques before i know i had i now thinking back i have seen them but i you know i didn't have the word for them they weren't at the forefront of my mind yeah um but it just helps you come at something sideways and and um yeah it's uh yeah the visual thesaurus is a good way to put it where it's like yeah you've seen a a a, a cape like mm -hmm. is a good example seen a cape we all know what a cape looks like you look on google image search for a cape and you get to see all the same capes that everybody else got to Ugh. look at and now you think that that's reference and you stop and you've got a typical <laughs> thing anyway i'm gonna go that's a that's a rant for my reference video that i'll make eventually um i could just but, shout in the background of that one too <laughs> Damn yeah. it. but even just like even going through and seeing, like, oh, I could have a leaf-shaped cape, I could have an oval ca oval cape, I could have a cape that looks yeah. like tree branches or whatever, or, like, something that looks like water. Whatever the cape is going to look like is going to come from what the, what the character is. Mm -hmm. And it's good to go look at Google Image Search and whatever, and hopefully, you know, better sources of reference. But if not just to see how far you can push what a cape is, like yep. to see how bendable and breakable that is and how you can Until it, you like just see what other people have gotten barely describe it as a cape anymore. Yeah, and it's just like that on a technicality. Not to like yeah. take somebody's extreme cape idea and then use that, but just to see like, oh, okay, I can actually like get away with quite a lot. I mm -hmm. can like fill it with holes, I can make it out of different materials, I can... That's just a bunch of crabs holding onto each other. Yeah, I mean, hey, yeah. they flow in the wind, it's a cape, there you go. <laughs> Uh, that's the only criteria yeah um but then yeah like it's like you know okay they've got a cape but what do, why would they wear a cape are they outside is it warm is it cold is it hot is it for the rain is it for camouflage is it for well that's and that and that's where disruption not or, just research but like getting into the why like yeah. really researching not just finding new pictures of stuff because i i think like armor is a great example and i i um 
have used this too, that armor was always built for very specific purposes. Yeah. It was built to solve certain problems and to defend against certain things. So even going and asking yourself, what does this character need to defend against? Yeah. What dangers is this character facing? And, and trying to think of different ways that they could protect against that. Maybe it's different materials. Yeah. Maybe different materials are available to them. And, and, and finding out, you know, okay, well, if, if I, I have a culture that doesn't have steel yet and they're trying to defend against fire crabs, Mm. what does that armor look like you know and you just start basically i can see your wheels turning <laughs> yeah. i was thinking <laughs> but, wool would be really good yeah so, so cool. you know but yeah. just thinking from the ground up again and, and and asking yourself why do anything i think i think that's to me one thing i really like is trying to go back as far as possible yeah go back with the idea of like okay you know even if it's designing i don't know it's boots yeah. like what are the boots trying to do there, yeah. you know, and, and, and what kind of environment are they, are they born out of? Yeah. And yeah. Like why don't like pirates wear cowboy boots? It's all, it's like a tree. This is the metaphor, the, the shape in my head where it's like, you're trying to go back down the branches and take a different turn somewhere and go back up Yeah. and find new, a new branch that you've never been to before. Yeah. If someone can draw that tree, tweet it to an <laughs> R&D fantasy. <laughs> of all ideas. Yeah, just I want to design that tree. This is the secret tree. But that's a perfect metaphor for it, because it's like just finding out the why of anything. Because even if you do find out the why of something, it just, it allows you to, like, once you've seen enough, like, why questions answered, you can start to, even if you're wrong, make up answers that feel right to you and to others you know if, mm -hmm. if, you, if you can't get that perfect reference if you can't find that inspiration you at least get a, a really good trustworthy feeling of what an, a, a satisfying answer to why should be exactly um, well and there's there's the that's back to the verisimilitude thing the truthiness of it is that even if you're as a as a viewer and i know i've seen lots of things like this where um you don't know what it's for but you can tell it's been well thought through and it definitely serves a purpose yeah. that you can believe in. Even that, where, where you as a viewer don't know, um, even that's a good space to be in. Well, one of the, one things I like, one of the things I like to do sometimes is uh, there is a subreddit called, what is it? It's like a what's this thing or what is this? Mm. And people just, they find weird objects in nature or in their garage or whatever and they put it on there and people kind of either recognize it or they deduce what it is mm -hmm. and it's really fun to like see if you can see what this lump of metal is based on how it's shaped and what function it could yeah, have and it's oh, just cool. like it's it's a fun sort of training challenge mm -hmm. that's a neat idea so um just to touch back in with the drawing um yeah. once all the sketching is done i kind of it's, the sketch is still a bit rough, but I, this inking stage is kind of a nice time to, to do additional design work and, and think about a few of the particulars here and there. Um, I personally, this I think, you know, it's been... I can't remember a time when I didn't lean the most heavily on line. Mm. Line's kind of always been my go-to communication tool. Um, and I used to feel bad about that, but over the years I've just come to embrace it fully this mm. is and I think anytime I'm questioning myself I see a, a drawing by Mobius or Mignola and I just <laughs> think nope that's that's my path that's yeah. my line yeah, will work line will work just fine because those guys can create ancient thousand year old magical vistas that take you away in, in amazing universes of imagination with mostly just line work and yeah, Mignola does it with a sharpie yeah, yeah. Just go to, yeah. Go to London Drive well, I guess Staples and in just... in fairness, he, it's he's mostly shape, I guess. But, yeah. But still, you, you get the point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I just I like using it. and more and more I've actually been trying to lean on coloring techniques that allow the line to feature more. Mm. Uh, so I've been shading even less lately, uh, and I've been trying to use colors that that don't create as much contrast, just so that uh, the line b remains the emphasis. Hmm. Just because, you know, I think this is just personal preference, but I've seen a lot of images lately of um, just line work from comics and then color. Yeah. And all power to the colorists. They Comic colorists can do amazing work, and it's a very challenging job, and they do, they do great. But there's something I always kind of still prefer 
even in my own work, I prefer the line work to the to to colored. Yeah. Yeah, some gets some can get really lost in coloring if it's not like a perfect marriage. Like I think Hellboy and the Guy Davis run of BPRD were both like masterfully colored, like perfectly chosen. Because it was so restricted, I think too. Yeah. That it, it kind of like it lived beside the line work. Yeah. Um, rather than making the line work almost seem like, thanks for the help. I'll yeah. Go, you know. Yeah. So this brush, you went ahead and dared to create a custom brush on my computer. Um, Just stinking up your. Photoshop brushes. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, yeah. it looks like a fun brush to use. I mean, I don't make a lot of brushes. I like, only like, make I don't, this like, one. Yeah, like I don't make a big deal about no nope. what brushes use. But I, I'm I'm not gonna delete this one. I kind of want to try it out. But explain it to people because I don't think it was included in the video. No, but it's no. a good one. It's good. well, it's really simple to make. Um, yeah, I, I and I don't even remember why I picked it up. It was over the years I've downloaded other other artists' brush sets in Photoshop, and eventually, like, I delete the ones that I haven't used after a while. Yeah, and this was the one the one that survived all of the purges. Um, just, uh, but it, it's it's just a it's like a normal round brush that has size and opacity uh, set to pen pressure, but instead of a circle, it's kind of a rounded downward facing triangle. Hmm. And for whatever reason, it just feels good that the the round Photoshop brushes can kind of tend to kill your line a little bit. Yeah. That it feels a little bit just too uniform. Yeah. A little too flat. And there's something about this. I mean, I'm sure a bunch of shapes would work, but for whatever reason, this triangle shape works re really well. It's not quite a wedge or like a chisel tip, so you're not getting those really thin lines when you don't want them to. Mm. But it just kind of messes with your line a little bit. Yeah. Um. So it keeps it feeling a little bit more active. Yeah. Um, I've been, yeah, I've been using it for years. Nice. Just, it's like my go-to inking brush and I, I tend to just, yeah, use it for, for everything. It's funny watching this at almost real time playback because all of my mistakes and little <laughs> errors just are... That's fine. The one thing that I like about doing this project is that it's all, it's just, it just shows that you're human. <laughs> like, I mean, there's a, there's a nudity to it. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, yeah. like my videos always run a lot faster, so most of my mistakes get kind of covered up. But it is like really intimidating <clears throat> and kind of scary to do it, like to go up and just record something and then just upload it without editing it or trimming it. But yeah, uh, it's kind of one thing that I'd want if if I could just uh, change the art world or whatever in any way, it would just be to just completely demystify it or like where we would just like banish all the divas and it's just mm -hmm. like just draw just make just come up with neat ideas and draw it well and then tell us how you did it yeah and it's like yeah. like there's there, everybody makes mistakes no one's a pro star master like you know it's just it's just it's nice and to just it kind of work just wear your sweatpants and just draw well that's that's the thing i i, I feel like we're really fortunate to be around at, in this era um, because I, I, I've told a few people that, that um, even just a, a few of the teachers that I had in college, um, they tried to pass on this mentality of, hi, keep your techniques a secret. Like your techniques are everything. And if you find out a way to do something, like you, tr you guard that because the moment someone else figures out how to do it, you are useless. <laughs> and it was a really, um, golden egg centric mentality yeah um whereas i think the modern age and not like in the internet and artists being able to reach out to each other and just build these communities across the across the globe um everybody's sharing techniques you can go online and look at so many videos about people like here's me painting a picture and here's here are my all my brushes and yeah. you know here are tutorials about about this kind of thing and yeah the thing that it's proven is that we're not a, a basket of golden eggs were geese mm -hmm. um, that, that like your technique is great but you don't even know a fraction of the things that it can do unless you've seen it in the hands of someone else yeah and they can reveal new pathways for you that you would never have have got you would never have gotten to mm -hmm. without them even seeing like what someone else does with your brush yeah it teaches you oh I haven't been I haven't even tapped into the the 
beginning of what it's capable of. Yeah. Um, or just like, like my my own work right now is just such a a, a mix of things that. I've learned um, just through work, but so much of it is stuff that I've seen other artists at work do, mm -hmm. stuff that Tom's done, uh, tutorials I've watched online. Like it just, it's uh, yeah, it's amazing. DVDs. Yeah, I'm like late nights working on tight deadlines, <laughs> like <five> Des <laughs> desperation and rage <laughs> yes. teaching you new techniques. Oh yeah, and like yeah. speed, trying to get stuff done super fast. That yeah. Taught me a lot of things. Oh yeah. Just even like learning stuff from students, like I even, yeah, like there's been a couple of students where they just asked me about one thing about Photoshop they've heard about, yeah. or they just showed me a way better way to do something super simple. Yeah. And I've never, like I've just completely jumped on board and just swallowed the pill like immediately and just yeah. ran with it. Heck, even I, I have a four year old and a two year old, um, and just the joy of a marker making a line yeah and what that line can be even that's reminded me of just how much fun this is yeah how much fun this can be yeah i think uh a lot of people also they get they kind of worship the idea of uh brushes or like if i could only see what brushes that guy uses or what sort of like tools she has yeah. then they might unlock the secret that they've been hiding this whole time mm -hmm. where you really, if you could just be able to draw something this good with poop on a stick. <laughs> yeah. And like, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. Like, whatever just flows naturally. Like, if you just grab a pencil or... Like, you could be... You could you could do professional concept art with Crayola Crayon. Oh, yeah. As long as you just put the time in and got used to the material and how it handles and, and what you were doing with it. Mm-hmm. In moments like these, I was waiting for Photoshop to catch up to me. This is a new bug I've noticed. I updated it to the 2015, I think. And if you hit undo more than once, like yeah. in succession, it 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 freezes, and I and I, hit I, undo I can't lot. stand it. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the next update. I hope they deal with it. But this is really just yeah, it's really frustrating. Well, if anything, too, it gave me a moment to think. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah. Um, did you have... There were some questions. Yeah, so you to, you on the Reddit this? thread that I started in rd and I mentioned to everybody that we were going to be doing a big, long video with Matt Rhodes. And I said that if people ask questions, um, that we would answer them. So there are some... Let me see... Um, Let's see their names. So, Cytus3 was asking... It's always uh, great to read internet names in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially if you've never even read it before. Uh, let's see. Um, do you have a favorite class to illustrate? Yeah. What is absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, it's my favorite class to illustrate, and it's my favorite class to play. Um, I, I love the rogue space. Mm. Um I like playing rogues. I like drawing rogues. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I think it's I think it's the best. I like being sneaky and devious and um, undercover, and it can be a bit of a cheat. Actually, rogue are, even just for a, from an illustration standpoint, they're fun because they have very specific. Um, uh, <laughs> Okay, how to put it. You can have big areas of negative space and tight little clusters of detail, and it makes sense. Like a yeah. big ro a big robe flowing or like a hood or a cloak yeah. can cover up a lot of space, but then you get this like little explosion of buckles and rivets and hilts and engraving and Well what is it? It's uh stress and rest. Exactly. I think. It's like yeah. areas of stress and areas of rest. Yeah. And playing a balance of those things. Mm-hmm. I like drawing fighters and sorcerers. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. There weren't too many questions, but there were right. some, so I'll just go through here. Uh, it's not like we really need them to help. We can talk with Tom and I anytime we start talking about this. No, we can I, go I, I, Yeah, but I, I love answering questions. I, I just spent the last couple of years working as an illustration teacher, and that was like one of the things that I just loved the most was when someone asked me a question and I got to explain something to them but uh, okay 
How? Oh yeah. Okay. So Living Nexus is asking, how did you develop your style? Which artists Ooh. did you emulate until you found a style that was uniquely yours? Oh, the style this, question. This, I, got, I, got, I got a style rant that I usually use. Yeah. But uh, Me too. Yeah, style. Um, Here goes. Um, no, I... Uh, actually, you know what's great? I just today watched a video about that it, where an artist was talking about style. Uh, and I should, I should tweet a link to it. Yeah, I want to see um, it. Because it was it was pretty cool, but um, he put forward and sorry I don't remember your name, but I'll 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 send the link out. Um, he put forward the idea that there's um, a chosen style and an inherent style, or or an intentional style and a chosen style, mm. and it would be like the difference between um, your signature. He, he explained it with a signature to start with. There's actually it's like a 20 minute video. It's some really good thoughts on the subject, but your signature. You chose it, you, you decided, you know, there's, there's any number of ways for you to write your name, and you chose one to use, yeah. but there's an inherent quality to it that just is natural to you where you have a particular lean to how your, how your, um, your hand goes, like with the angle at which you lean letters, yeah. um, just the, the length of your fingers, the, the all these different factors mm -hmm. that make it, you chose to sign it that way, but only you could sign it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Without thinking. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where someone else would have to go to great pains to, to copy it. Um, and so for myself, I'm, I'm just mean, I, in particular, I, I feel like I get this, this style question a lot just because I make really cell shaded looking art yeah. for games that are meant to be real, uh, rendered in a semi realistic way. Yeah. So there's an incongruity there. So the question comes up a lot and it's, and especially working in like AAA games where there's, there's like all most concept art you see is, is highly polished and yeah. rendered. Um, or well, all the concept art that gets released. Um, but I would say that um, the style, like my own comes from like growing up as a history of, of pausing Disney videos and drawing characters, um, loving comic books um, like Ed McGuinness's Deadpool. Yeah. And uh, Joe Mad's early stuff and all these different uh, comic artists, uh, J. Scott Campbell. I forget what, yeah, J. Scott Campbell it was, it was huge. He was a big one for me. Yeah. Um, so there were, there, the, I, I, in, in my younger years, I, I copied a lot, like all of that stuff. Bruce, Tim, and all his mm -hmm. work, and, and there's just so much stuff that I, I just copied, copied, copied. And if you're a, uh, a young artist start, starting out, do it. Copy, copy, copy. Uh, because it just gets you into the frame of you, you start figuring out how people solve those problems. It's kind of like when the teacher like holds your hand when you first start learning to write. Exactly. Letters, sort of. Yeah. You need to trace the, the, the letters and then you need to copy. Okay, here's a circle and a line. Yeah. Until you start learning the techniques for yourself and you start life drawing, you start branching out. Yeah, you get a sense of why they did things that way mm -hmm. or like how you might do them a little bit better or like exactly you get used to it and you find like that was easy let's try this now and yeah but i mean even even tom and i we draw i mean maybe being siblings it's even it's harder to see i would say we draw fairly differently there's overlaps but yeah but, but i think a lot of it comes from even just the way i draw it comes from where my priorities lie yeah is again going back to what i said earlier where it's like once you get it i'm good like once once I can show an image to somebody and they understand what's happening, yeah, I'm I'm satisfied. I don't care necessarily about the quality of the final image as an as an object unto itself. Yeah, I just care about the content of it. Mm. So my own approach is how do I get my idea across as clearly as possible, as quickly as possible, so I can get on to the next one. Yeah, um, which works pretty well for concept art. Yeah, it works really well. Um, yeah, for uh, you were, it was neat that you were talking about the the guy talking about uh, like the signature stuff mm -hmm. um, and how things are sort of innate. It's kind of it made me think it's sort of weird. Like I always just forget that we're brothers. Like to me, it, it's not like a big. Like, I mean, I know we. Are, but, <laughs> no, like, I, I'm I just like, like oh yeah, it's Matt Rose. Yeah, yeah, big deal. Like yeah, I know him. Um, but it's kind of neat because like we had the same comic books 
Yeah. Like, literally. We shared yeah. comics. <laughs> yeah. We watched the same movies. Yeah. We had the same hobbies. We sat uh, at the same kitchen table and drew every night. Yeah. And, yeah. and we both came out really differently with the same kind of inspirations. Yeah. Like, we definitely had different leanings. Like, oh, yeah. I was more Ed McGuinness, Muscle Heroes. You were more DreamWorks. Yeah. Like, Prince of Egypt and Sinbad and... Oh, oh yeah, Prince and the of Beast Egypt. And, the, and all that stuff. And I, I don't remember what my uh, influences were early on. They kind of changed as I went, but... Uh, and they're different now than they were even, like, five years ago and stuff, but... Um, but it's just neat how... I mean, I've had people say that we draw kind of similar, in a like way. Like I say, I think there's some overlap. But people also say we look a lot alike, and I don't see it. No. I mean, I can see that we're related, but... I have to believe it because enough people have said it, but... Yeah, but it, I, I think it's just the familiarity thing, but I mean, we definitely depict, like, paint things differently, like, draw things differently. Mm -hmm. But, um, I always described it to people, because it, it has come up a lot in, like, my real life, like, people have asked me this, but I think it's like, you're more animation and I'm more comic books. Yep. Or, like, more European comic books, maybe. I, but I don't know. I, I would say I don't even think about style. Like I don't care about style anymore. That kind of well, like leads me to my next thing. Yeah, that's the, yeah. I was gonna get like, too. When like the <clears> thing that I was always telling my students is like, I see them constantly drawing stuff the same way they've always done it. It's the same facism. It's the reason I don't like people drawing anime all the time or like drawing Pokemon over and over and over again, is because they're just drawing the same face, the same body types, the same poses, and they're not learning anything new. You're going to so, like this video. Okay, good. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the thing that I always... I worry about my students that were stuck in, like, these anime traps or, like, like Tumblr kind of has a style. And that comes <laughs> up a lot. There's, like, the Tumblr style. Um, the red nose. Yeah. Uh, I could... Whatever. I know. <laughs> you break it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the way that I see it is, like, you got to kind of take the, the hard pill and just draw as realistically as you can for as long as you can possibly handle it. Like, ignore all style, stop thinking about it, stop waiting for your prints to come, just start drawing as realistically as you can, and as as you're doing studies and completely abandoning style, what happens is you get sick of drawing things real, really realistically because it takes a long time, so you'll draw things faster. You find your own faster. shorthand. You find your own shorthand, exactly. And that's what style is. Yeah. Like, like that's, that's the, that's the secret to just coming up with your own style. That's yeah. it. Your style is hard work through your hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, you, you just, you find what you want to communicate. And like I say, like learn from other people. That's great. But eventually, uh, like, I can't, I mean, this video is perfect and it's great that I just watched it today it was, um, he used an anime nose in particular. That, yeah. You know, you learn to draw a nose this one way, and it looks like a little triangle. Yeah. But then when you go to turn the face forward, that's still all you know. Yeah. But if you know why that artist chose to simplify the nose in the way that they did, yeah. then you can move the nose, then re-simplify it. Yeah. Re-simplify the new shape, and suddenly the style has versatility in it, and it's it's... It's got merit. Yeah. Yeah, it's not anime as, like, as, it, like, all, like, a, as a hard and fast rule. But it's just, it's that, like, v art via template. Yeah. Non-thinking, let's get this done. We gotta get it out the door. Mm -hmm. Sort of just imitation stuff. It's I like, should I should make a note here as I'm rendering, or as I'm doing this sweater with this texture. Yeah. Um, just to talk about cheating. Cheat away? You cheat. should cheat all the time. Cheat away? <laughs> I just, I drew, I did the lines on the collar and I just realized I didn't feel like doing the shirt. So this is just a quick and dirty way to, when you have a repeating pattern, um, just get that done. Yeah. Get it done fast. Well, it's like, do you get it? Yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. <laughs> if, if everybody reads it as a knit sweater, I'm good. Yeah. Then we're solid. Can you get an idea of what the pattern's doing? Can you get an idea of like how spongy and like how much, it, how hefty it is? Yeah. That's pretty much all you got to get across. Yeah. But even, but being able to do that, you've drawn cable knit sweaters, you've drawn wool, you've drawn silk, you've drawn, well, and so this, you know how to, uh, how much to bend it to make as it a, feel right. As a note too, um, you know, they didn't, this didn't show up because you have your other monitors set up. Yeah. But um, I went and found images of sweaters. I found the knit that I liked, and then I drew that pattern. 
mm. and copy it. So it's still it's still based on reference. It's still based on, uh -oh. on what? I have to call the police for stealing. Uh, stealing uh, stealing sweater patterns. You get some. Uh, Do you have a sweater pattern <laughs> torrent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You would not some knitting torrents. <laughs> some knitting torrents here. Oh, I swear they're out there. Oh, I'm sure. I'm absolutely. There's sheet music torrents. There is. Okay, next question. Um, I hope that uh, answered the, the style question. Um, uh, so this. Uh, okay. Anyway, my question. Oh, this is from Elvira Linde. Actually, that's this week's winner that I've got to draw. Well, so, hey. Um, she's been around since like the very beginning. I'm so glad she won. Anyway. Um, my question for both of you would be, do you have a favorite setting to draw in? Sci-fi, fantasy, etc. Also, as concept artists, how involved are you in the process of how the scenes look? Do you mm. do any kind of storyboarding, or is it mainly character and scenery designs? Okay, there's a lot of questions in here, and these are all really good questions. Yep. Alright, the first one was, uh, do you have a favorite setting to draw in? Fantasy, hands down. Yeah. No question. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I... I, I Personally, I'm just way more interested in it right now, and a, a major part of it is just uh, vulnerability. Hmm. In a way, I'm I'm way more interested in characters that and and circumstances and stories that are. Um, there's stakes. There's stakes. There's per whereas in like in sci-fi, and I know there's totally you know stakes and peril and and yeah. and danger in in sci-fi, but there's just something so much more. You know, you're left to your own devices. There's a simplicity in fantasy where it's like, you know, bad guys are here. Yeah. Can you defend yourself? You got to get out the hard way. In yeah. Sci -fi, in sci-fi, it's like, oh, they're so advanced that they just have force fields in their wristwatches. Which is why I love, you know, um, Star Wars as much as I do. Yeah. Like, it, it would be the question of, like, Star Trek or Star Wars. And why I think yeah. I fall on the Star Wars side or is do. because it's just stories about people in circumstances it like the science in that one yeah is is more magic than science yeah um which i i like well even when i think about it too like the stuff that makes sci-fi uninteresting is the magic it's the force field in the hat or the laser that can shoot through a doorway or whatever <clears throat> but when it comes to even fantasy stuff like i don't like it like the magic stuff about it it's like the swords and the climbing of a rope and like like all the leather you get to wear, all the leather and the belts and the skull shoulder pads. But it's never like I don't I never like it because like oh wow I can turn this door into gold, or like yeah yeah I can shoot a fireball. Not, like the yeah. magic part is not what is interesting to me. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the swashbuckling kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I find that normally I am. Um, I I go into fantasy during the winter and then <laughs> sci-fi yep. in the summer. Yep. I think it's because like fantasy's cozy in summer. Yeah, fantasy is cozy and fire. And then in the summer, I look at a lot of stars, mm. and then I start thinking about aliens and listening to Coast to Coast AM with our with uh, like Art Art Bell, like all their old reruns and stuff. Uh, um, and uh, but actually, last summer I completely missed sci-fi. I just did not. I just did not care. I, I think I'm just ready to call it. I think I'm just all fantasy. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, uh, definitely. So, um, also, as concept artists, this is the next part, how involved are you in the process of how the scenes look? Do you do any kind of storyboarding, or is it mainly character and scenery designs? Uh, so, uh, at Bioware... Uh, we should probably should have mentioned who you were and what you do. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I'm lead concept artist on the Inquisition, uh, or on the Dragon Age uh, team at, at Bioware. And so I'll, I'll speak, especially with Inquisition, um, with Dragon Age Inquisition, we uh, really pushed into new territory there. Uh, we would do environments. We would create, um, occasionally we would do paintings of, of, of scenes. I, I did a few on Mass Effect. Uh, but on Inquisition, we really dug into it. And uh, so we actually did start doing storyboarding um, of scenes in a, in a much more uh, intentional way. It had been done before, but uh, we, we had at least three concept artists who really just put themselves totally into storyboarding for several months. And we had uh, our great lead animator, Paul Dutton. Um, he actually has experience in, in animation, um, was uh, one of the main animators or, or, or an animator on uh, The Illusionist and a lot of other uh, awesome movies. And so he, he kind of mentored us, men, mentored us through it and, and just learning about film language and, and, and how, to get, 
how to guide the eye through through motion and stuff. We learned a lot, and mm -hmm. and it's fun to be able to just take a few months to just draw really fast and messy. Yeah. Um, and so what we would do, what we're trying to do is kind of just keep that rolling and, and just continue on with that. Like the storyboarding is really great. Um, we've been doing beat boards, which are like bigger, broader storyboards where I'd, I'd say they're more like illustrations that kind of just touch on major points. Yeah. And a lot of those that you'd done for Inquisition showed up online, didn't they? Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're all in my, most of my pages now are filled with just that stuff okay. uh, where it was it was all kind of trying to get a sense of character or setting or you know and sometimes it was a major story beat sometimes it was more of a more about tone mm -hmm. um and so uh so yeah and that that helps to inform then it goes it goes back into informing character design and environment design and, yeah and all that. it's great too because it gives the concept artists even more opportunity to know exactly who these characters are and what the story they're going to be facing yeah is. yeah because just drawing a character in a vacuum um can only get you so far it kind of really helps to put them in context my preference going forward and it would just be to to almost to storyboard and beatboard characters before we even begin the concepting process hmm. so that they're almost more entities of the story and we can see them hmm for what they represent in the narrative and yeah. and all that stuff and then go into detail yeah well i think you would agree that story comes first oh yeah like yeah. the writer is the like that's what this is for like the there's no character without a story yeah and and if this characters don't work for the story then yeah you failed well and, and i'd say too that i'm in games just because that's all i can speak to yeah um uh and, and specifically with Bioware because that's that's the one company I work for is uh, and that, and that I love dearly now is um, is that story is penultimate but gameplay is a part of that like I would I would I still make the distinction of story and setting um, so you know there's there's the 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 characters and the story and the plot. But there's the world itself and the rules within it and the history and the, the environment and the cultures and, and um, because even like gameplay are, are massively necessary because if, you know, they have particular classes that fight in particular ways, you know, that needs to be woven into the fibers of everything. Yeah. You know, if you have a world that has a lot of archers, you know, that the archery becomes an important common thing that this is how people hunt and this equipment is available and and you know different cultures do it in different ways and you mm -hmm. know there's all these different questions and that all springs out of what the gameplay like what is fun to play and then how do you support that in the world in the setting so it all looks like it's unified it doesn't look like here's the story part and now here's the gameplay part yeah it's all completely bound up yeah. So you can't take any piece out from, from any other piece. Yeah. That's the goal, anyway. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, those are some good questions. Let's see uh, if there's any more. Oh. I should know that this part of the painting process, um, I have now since found a plug-in for Photoshop that does a, an auto-fill for all of my line work. Oh, nice. Um, so I can, ju it just fills it up with random colors and then I can come in with a paint bucket and go, you know, take all the sections in the jacket and just say green, 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 green. I green, have green. that. You could have used it. I couldn't find it on your list. What? Oh. oh. okay. So I just. Well, maybe I need to reinstall it. Anyway. I just tediously painted through all of this. This, <laughs> this is by far my least hey, favorite Hey, we would part. have been like an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is, uh, this is why all my lines are closed. All my loops are closed on this drawing because mm. it's like, I've just gotten used to now painting for being able to use this thing later. Um, this is the worst part of every painting for me, is yeah. flatting. It's just, it's absolutely necessary, but you just get all your flat colors in there. Yeah. Um, yeah it's it's like, just, can't they just know? Can't they just know? It's like, you just put the green on the one corner, and it's like, okay, that's the coat color. Just go. Just trust yeah. me, it'll work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but necessary, we'll get there. It's just filling it in. So we'll just talk about other stuff while I do that. Yeah. It's just, I, it's so frustrating because it's just, it's just drawing it all over again, but less interesting. But this is part of it too. There's so many parts of a painting that I, I just, uh, they're necessary evils to communicate. And 
it's like, do you have the discipline to actually just sit there and do it? Yeah. Because there's like, it went, even as soon as I start this step, I just want to stop. I just want to give up and just throw the image in the garbage or just give people the line work and say, I don't, I don't even care. You should see if like EA would pay for like an outsourcer for you. <laughs> like you could just... Well, no. And honestly, the, the plugin really works. Like honestly, being able to just do the multi-fill thing, mm. um, it just fills up every closed loop. Yeah. Uh, that has taken the time I spend on these things down. I think, okay, as a warning, the one I got was like a hundred dollars. Yeah, that's but the same I, one I got. I have now saved so many hours yeah. of this tedious drudgery yeah. uh, that it's paid for itself a hundred times over. Yeah, I got that when I did that graphic novel and yeah. it saved... It's e ridiculous. Even if it only saved like five hours. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. every hour counts. Like, <laughs> it's another the hour of your life. you've done it, you're just like, I could have been done days ago if yeah. I had used every hour yeah. or weeks or whatever, but even for this sort of stuff. But yeah. One thing I've learned, sort of the hard way, uh, and it's just sort of like a subtle thing, I think I mentioned it before, but like when I'm coming up with the drawing and like the concept, I listen to music. Yep. If I, but if when I'm doing the tedious stuff, I'll listen to like a documentary or a podcast or yeah, something. Yeah, you need to keep your mind engaged. Yeah, but you yeah. can't, like if I'm listening to talking while I'm trying to come up with an idea, it's yeah. completely neuters it. It's way too distracting. Way too distracting. Yeah. So you want half of your brain engaged mm -hmm. when it's just, you don't need to, you don't need to think it's just execution. Yeah. But yeah, for sure. Anytime I'm doing thumbnails or I'm trying to get the energy into that first sketch, yeah. it can, it's just music. Yeah. It's like critical. Um, I was just, oh, I had a thought about something. I can't remember. Oh yeah. I was just going to say like, I remember, I think it was like Sergeant or like Anders Zorn or something who was saying that like. Like, once you get the sketch done, it's all just, like, the tedious work. Like, mm -hmm. now it's just a matter of getting it done. Yeah. And to me, I've actually, I kind of like that stuff, where it's, like, when you have the sketch ready to go, mm. and you can just ink it without thinking. Like, you don't have, right. to, well, you don't have to solve anything anymore. Right. It's just such a, such a relief. I, I, I would say... It is boring, though. No, I, yeah, I, um, I've been doing some beatboards lately, and I, I think that, um... To me, they are at their most creative, they're at their best when they're thumbnails, mm. and then everything above that is just, okay, all right. Like, it just it's making it presentable for people so that they can see how cool the image is in your head. Yeah. And <laughs> just trying to say, no, 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 see, it's, it, it, look, it would look like this. It looks like this up here. Yeah. It's just trying to actually go through all the legwork to, to get it out. Yeah. Well, it's like if, if, we, if it worked, we would just read books like we well, you know, write write descriptions it's and... funny i've been thinking about picasso a lot lately and i think i i know this sounds heretical probably to some people but i admire his laziness in a good way like i almost think he just had these ideas and he wanted to get them out and as he gets older and older and older it gets simpler and simpler and more direct and more abstracted Mm -hmm. And that there's something I like about being able to, you know, it's something powerful being able to say more with less yeah. and the ability to be able to do it. Like Mark Twain's old, you know, I, I would have written you a short letter, but I didn't have enough time. So I wrote you a long one instead <laughs> or however he said it. But yeah, I've um, never heard that. That's cool. Yeah. Or like, you know, brevity is a soul of wit, that kind of thing. Like I, yeah. it takes, it's well, even like graphic design. It's way harder to narrow things, or even like concept art you talked about before about getting the character to their core. Where it's yeah, like yeah. Drawing the character, getting them down to the fewest parts possible. Like the word, like the word for that is just elegance. Yeah. Like do you just is it enough to get? Is are you doing a lot with a little? Yeah. And yeah. being able to find that for yourself is mm -hmm. is great. Just a little note on color choice here. Um, for the most part, it should be self-evident, but I was I was trying to think of uh, this kind of brass texture or brass color for all of her uh, accessories. Um, just it's a, an indication of wealth, like consistency is an indication of wealth. Yes. That by having gold trim on her on her hilts and her buckles and all the buttons and all that stuff, it kind of it's the implication that they can afford to pay one person. Yeah. to do all of this and that it all came from the same shop or it all came from the same craftsman. Mm -hmm. um, it's not whatever was cobbled together 
at great need. It was like this may have all been gifted at the same time. or, or They're wealthy or, enough to choose what they have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought it was funny. I'm probably, I think I might be about to do it here. Um, I was just seeing on Twitter because I follow both you and Lindsay Laney. Just the com you were both talking. She was made a, making a comment about when you were drawing the the Raleigh thing about how old, how tired gold trim is. Oh, and how yeah, gold yeah. trim oh, yeah, is yeah. just so it's like gold trim is just so done. And Lindsay was just like, yeah, oh, I totally agree. And I'm thinking about this drawing. I was like, shit, I put that on everything. No, 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 <laughs> I put that on the whole code. because oh, it's um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> but it's I mean, it's true, it's true. No, I just it's like the World of Warcraft gold trim. Right, you know, oh, it's okay, just like, okay. or yeah. like the battle chasers, where it's just like, <clears throat> there's the gold trim and then the gold spiral stuff, and I mean gold trim. Right. Yeah. I just okay. Well, I just put a thin line around the whole coat. I pretty think much. that's fine. Oh, okay. I think okay. Lindsay will be okay with that. I hope. <laughs> For anyone out there, I, yeah, Lindsay Laney is actually. Uh, you should follow her work too. I, I'm pretty sure she's at Bethesda right now, um, but she is a good case in know your costumery and how that works. She did this great set of redesigns for the Origins characters um, from Dragon Age Origins that just like nail each character. Mm. Um, yeah, it's really good. So it's but that's one thing I've, I've been getting into a lot more lately is having, uh, I've, t I've talked about this before, that, that I've been able to interact with a few more people in the cosplay community. Mm. And just hearing their experiences and trying to build some of these costumes that uh, that we've designed and f hear, learning about their frustrations and l just even hearing their insights into how to make things easier. Yeah. Um, it's gotten me researching a lot more about just simple things like just tailoring and, um, and that kind of thing. Like stuff that is really easy to take for granted. But yeah, um, I was just saying uh, to your class when I... I came to talk that like concept art especially character design is 90 percent just figure drawing and drapery mm -hmm. and uh and it's it's you know it's uh, i i try to do a lot of figure drawing but i also try to draw a lot of people in full costume so i i can get a feeling for how, how things hang how different materials behave with each other mm -hmm. um and even figuring out more and more how clothing is cut in order to solve certain problems yeah. on the body. So, um, yeah, it's a wide world. Or even like, like, yeah, just simple stuff like the inside seam of the jeans is double, double mm -hmm. stitched because that's where the load is right, compared to the, yeah. the stitch on the outside. Like stuff like that. Yeah. I even just learned that recently, but I was like, that makes a lot of sense. But I've been trying a lot more, way more than ever before, to every piece of clothing or costumery or armor that I design is to think through how it's put on. Yeah. And and just the process, how it fits. Like, <coughs> just like, because I've been guilty in the past of just designing like, that, that looks cool. And there's like you'd have to literally make the thing out of rubber and like squeeze yourself into it with lube in order to to possibly you know make it any sort of to actually get it on yourself. So so now you know trying to think through. I really like to say it's like you when you're designing a character, you try to almost put yourself through the process of getting dressed in the morning mm -hmm. as them. Just imagine them like putting all of these things on. Hey, perfect timing on flipping through the layers here. Yeah. Now, getting dressed. There you go. Boom, boom. Paper doll. <laughs> yeah. Ready for more iterations. Well, and that's that's why I preserve this layer is yeah. uh, is so that like I, I can just like move that image over and then start from the blank again yeah. and create the next version. Mm -hmm. Oh, a little note. I I painted the little spots on the fe on the arrows there. Yeah. In her description, uh, Taylor said that Clara has a griffin that she keeps with her. Uh, now I didn't draw the griffin, um, but the griffin has... Um, I want to draw him anyway. I think I might draw him like in my sketchbook. He was cool. Yeah, good. yeah, definitely. Um, he has uh, these little starry spot feathers. So he has like a dark, like dark fur, or sorry, dark feathers with little spots on them that look like a starry night. 
So I like the idea that, you know, as it's shedding, she keeps all of these feathers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's kind of a scruffy, it was like the runt, I think. And, it, and it, so she keeps all these feathers and is able to make arrows out of them. And that, that wouldn't be the main brunt of her arrows, but she just have these special ones that have little starry spots built into the, like, in, in there. Or even like the, uh, like what's the, what's that, the main feather called on the arrow? There's like the one out of the three that's like the, yeah. it's always the different color. Like even yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what the, I can't, I used to know. I remember either. Oh, okay, now this part, um, just to explain, um, this is, again, cheap and dirty, uh, really quick way to get the indication of depth um, and volume is I like to just take the, the diffuse, uh, color is like what the color truly is. It's like the true color of something where if you were to just blast it with white light, um, it, that's what the color is. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's diffuse. And then I, I, I keep that for reference later and then I build a, a shadow layer. So I just darken it and add a little bit of a color like blue or red or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. the, uh, contra con uh, the contrast and color to the light source is going to be. And then I create a light layer. So it's like as though all of it was being blasted with light, which in this case, I, I lightened it and I added a little bit of uh, orange. Mm -hmm. So it's a little like a little bit of sunlight. Um, and then I put that on top and then just block it out and just mask it out and paint it back in. And that just, it's like just really simple way of, of painting the light cast on on shadows. And this is where, you know, this is where the cell shading look comes in because I'm really just using the two, um, the two values to, uh, to separate light and dark. I'm not doing a lot of rendering. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm using this just to indicate, uh, the next level of volume and, and, and form the shape of it. Um, it's, it's quick and dirty, like I said, um, well, but, it's like you're just sort of building up the structure like it's a polygonal drawing, basically. That's pretty much it, yeah. Like a low-poly yeah. sculpt. Yeah, exactly. It gives a little bit more indication of, of how things are meant to be shaped. But, yeah, um, sort of like where the light has to be. You kind of put it in there and then see kind of how yeah. you push and pull. It's like because of my love of line work, I, I try as much as possible to get the sense of volume and form out of the line work. Hmm. Um you know, and I, I feel like that's that's where I prefer to do it. So more and more, I'm I'm kind of leaving, I'm kind of sticking to just picking it one color mm. for things and and not worrying about the the light layer unless it's really necessary. Mm -hmm. The good thing about this too is that now you don't have to like when you do the highlights, you don't have to go and pick like the the sweater highlight color and then the torque highlight color and then the skin highlight color and then the lip highlight color. It just gets done automatically by just increasing all the values at the same time. Well, and the nice thing is it like it's, um, and I, I honestly, it was so long ago, I forget who it was that I, I first picked this up from, but you know, it's it just in the way that light behaves, it, you know, it's just, it's just adjustments on the diffuse color anyway. It's, sunlight shining on anything is just it's going to be lighter and it's going to have a little bit of a, a, a slight hint of the color whatever color the sun is at um yeah. so yeah you don't you don't it, it's it's kind of all solved in one go for you yeah and it does the trick <laughs> yeah it's, yeah, a, it's it a really elegant way to just think like of I, light like i say it's like if you get it then i'm good yeah Ooh. Excuse me. Excuse I me. will not. Okay, fine. And get out. Yeah, the rendering can be intimidating, like shading and lighting and surfaces and yeah. volume and form. And it's probably one of the things that I think takes the the most study. Maybe mm -hmm. is just getting the form right on stuff like yeah. how much shadow do you put around the edge of something as it's turning away from you and yeah exactly like uh, even like her chest compared to her belly like how much light's hitting the, like her chest at that angle mm -hmm. and why you know compared to something else and yeah with something like this i always recommend just like don't fixate on one part like don't kind of keep trying to work one spot for yeah more than a minute yeah. 
just kind of get it all, just do a pass over the whole thing, yeah. and that'll give you a way better sense of where it's lacking. Absolutely. Like, I, I, I always think that, like, I've started getting, like, because I've got a bad trick to memory, I try to just deal with stuff immediately. Right. But I've sort of started letting myself let stuff go for a while, because if I'm going to notice that it's wrong now, I'm probably going to notice that it's wrong later. And if, if I don't mm-hmm. notice that it's wrong later, it's probably been hidden enough <laughs> or shrouded that it's yeah. not that wrong. Right. And that's kind of what, what I'm, I go along with that sort yeah. of thing. It's just... Yeah. Well, and it, it's, it's another context thing. It's getting a, a, a long view of it. You can just rough it in really quickly. Sometimes I'll even make a new layer and just do a really quick and dirty pass on what where I think the light should fall. Yeah. And then I'll lower the opacity on, on that and I'll do a slightly more detailed pass of... Uh, it's like sketching where I think the light is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So really, we just just trying to find that line where I think, where I imagine the light terminates. Yep. Um, in some big, soft, rounded cases, like I do it a little bit on the cloak here where I soften it a bit. Yeah. Um, I don't always do that, but it, you know, it, it can just help when that area was so big. Yeah. That I kind of wanted to ease the transition, but for the most part, just I, I tend to just use a hard line just. Hmm. Yeah, but I guess as long as you're probably consistent with the fact that you're gonna just draw a hard line every once in a while, then it would work. Mm-hmm. Like if you just had hard lines at the terminator of every surface, it would work, I suppose, better. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. But you know, it's whatever is gonna work in whatever place. There's, it's not really like a set law. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's like, does it communicate? There you go. Could it be communicated better? Yeah. Sure. You know. Phase it in a bit. I did some. I think the next step is some real cheating. Here's a. Oh yeah, here it goes. So, <laughs> here's a. One of the um, downfalls of this technique is that um, certain surfaces need a little bit more love than just two colors. Yeah. Skin is one of them, and uh, giving them. Uh, uh, this is just me cheating and making some really quick and dirty uh, subsurface scattering. So just when light goes into the skin, it actually it doesn't just stop at the surface. It goes in and it bounces around a little bit in our blood-filled skin, and it's great. And so it creates usually this kind of line between the light and the shadow that's a little bit more red. So all I did was I duplicated the light layer, made it a little bit darker, a little bit redder, put it underneath, and then blurred it back in. So there you go. Just like a turnip. That's a, that's a good way to do that. Yeah, it's just it's it just throws it and gives the indication. It may, brings the the skin to life a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's easy, and the kids love it. Nice. So this cloak, I think you're about to go into the weird effect on it. Yeah. Well, what's in the story of this character? Like, what's this okay. cloak about? Okay. Well, there. Um, it it's a wind cape from mountain gods. Uh, and that is actually all the information that I had on the cloak. It's just an artifact that's been picked up along the way. Sometimes vagueness is also sweet. <laughs> I, I, well, I liked it because that should be really a mountain cloak from, or a wind cloak from the mountain gods is, is, that's pretty awesome. It does, I do know it gives her the ability to basically teleport within about 60 meters of wherever she is. Mm. So it should have the, you know, I wanted to have this kind of ethereal, um, non-physicality kind of drifting as well like it's kind of going out yeah yeah like reaching slightly so i i kind of wanted it to just you know flowing off of the torque i wanted it to look like it's made out of out of windy non-material um so there was a bit of experimenting to do i i i first tried just blurring the edges a little bit with the line work but then i got that it was looking too muddy so I delete the lines and, um, yeah. Oh, here's some, I'm just organizing stuff. Um, this, I, I kind of just took all of my layers and I put them in a folder called layers. Um, and I have a version of it that's flattened. So if I need to go back, I can, but now I have a version that's just, um, just the, the flat image. It's all just compiled. It's all just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, she just sits by herself there now. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah. I think the cloak might be coming up. But what I was going to do is essentially was try to come up with a way to distort it. And, and um, it's, yeah, it 
it sits in contrast to the line work. Everything else is line work, so it's it, it's gonna look kind of stand out and look a little unnatural. But that's really it's just trying to get whatever effect is necessary to communicate what the object is. Yeah, and it um, is different and weird. And, yeah, and if this was moved forward into a game, you know, it's it, gonna have an effect like this. You know, it's so yeah, the effects it makes sense for them to have these sort of liberties with the style of the drawing. Yeah. Because it's not about the drawing, it's about the character mm -hmm. and the ideas behind the character. Well, and this is, I, okay, and this is something I've been talking more about lately, is that um, it would be more than just, here's the drawing that, I to me, the, a critical part is I can I can do the simple draw, the sim more simple drawings because they come with a conversation hmm. that, that, whenever possible I try to go and talk to whoever is going to be trying to create this thing and sit with the drawing and say okay here's what I'm thinking for here and this is this is my thought here and here's what you know this is this is it's as much telling the story to them of the character mm -hmm. as it was told to me so that they can take all of their expertise and pour it in yeah um and and basically like get on board with uh with things and, and um and elevate it. That, that's one thing I love about this process is that, you know, writers or, or, or game designers will come up with an idea and I'll take that idea and start at zero and bring it to my 100. Yeah. And then when I'm done that and I have an image, I take that to a visual effects artist or a character artist or an environment artist and they take my drawing from zero to their 100. And it's just each person stands on the next person's shoulders. And finally, what's done is so much bigger than any of you could have done by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really fun process. It's one of my favorite parts about that kind of line of work is just being part of a team. Yeah. Like, it's it's nice that you can offer your small part and it's not all yep. up to you. And you're just sort of helping something bigger than yourself along. Mm -hmm. And the collaborative side of concept art is to me one of the most appealing aspects of it yeah yeah absolutely and even like like even with what either of us did for like the dragon age series mm -hmm. there's so few things that i can look at and say i designed that because actually like four or five or six of us all had a hand yeah in how yeah. it went even if the, no one else drew anything on it mm -hmm. um they all said, like, hey, you know, that shouldn't be there, or, you know, they had their own input that changed it. Yep. And, yep. and even, like, and not to mention the modelers and animators and stuff. But, oh, absolutely. But, yeah, just letting it all go. And, like, you could spend years on one character, I mean, rarely, or you could do a hundred different helmets, and none of them get used, and they all just get trashed. <laughs> or, like, put in the annex of an art book or something. Yep. And it's like, that's fine. Yep, it's fine. It's part of the work. It's it's doing the work that's like the best part about it. It's not like being able to brag about, you know, you design this character or like isn't this the coolest thing in the world? Yeah. It's just the process is is the reward. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's I, I like the the description uh, Matt Goldman, our art director, used of it's we're not we're not just painting paintings to go in a in the dusty corner of a museum somewhere. It's like the collaborative nature of it makes it much more like building a cathedral when that there's the stained glass guy and that's great. But we also have people who are doing masonry and yeah. um, the fr wood frames for different things and the people who do plaster and like all these different people who are necessary, all working on something that's going to make so much more of an impression. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, yeah, it's a fun opportunity. Mm -hmm. Or it's even kind of like... Uh... Like, our video game's art. You know, I don't want to open that can of worms because people get passionate about it, but, like, when I think about it, it's like... Video games are, are an art in the way that, like, a city is art. Mm -hmm. You know, like, there's art in it. Right. Artists mm -hmm. were needed to help make it what it is, but you may as well say that video games are accounting because accountants worked on the game, too. Yeah, that's a, and helped you it could look at it that way, for sure. Yeah, I, uh... Either way, it's collaborative and then friggin' awesome. <laughs> it's just so cool. I, I like to... Yeah, I, I've i said... I don't... It, it's easy to explain and describe myself as an artist to people. Yeah. But I... Just because it, it, people get it, it makes sense. But I think of myself as more of a craftsman 
mm. than an artist. Um, just because again, yeah, it's like, it's the work is the fun part and the process and working with a team and solving the problem. I love my, I'm at my happiest when I'm able to wrap form around function mm -hmm. so tightly that you can't tell the difference anymore. Um, when, you know, you can design a thing that just fits and solves exactly the problem it was meant to solve. Yeah. Or, you know, to me, the best pieces of of work that I've ever done, it's they solve a problem for five different departments mm. that, you know, they work, they solve a problem for animation and gameplay and story and VFX and it, 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 all, it all, it all comes together. Yeah. Like, does that character have to have a fire cape? <laughs> it's just like some problem that's been plaguing teams for months and then it's just, wait, we can just take that out. Or it's like, you know, we could just take the fire off and just make a, yeah, a, a fire pattern well, that's I, sewn on the cape. You know, something I, like that. Yeah, I'm I'm fond of saying I, I I felt like at a certain point on Dragon Age Inquisition, some of the best work I did was just going and eliminating the need for concept art. Mm. It would be you know people would come in with a request and it would just be okay. I'm gonna go talk and we're gonna have a conversation and find out that you've asked for a mirror when what you really need is a torch and we've already built five of them. Mm. So here we go. And, you know, just finding out th that it's, it's problem solving. Yeah. And sometimes you don't even need a drawing for that. Mm -hmm. This, I'm just kind of flailing with the smudge brush, trying to find a shape that is wispy and flowy enough that doesn't look too overworked, but yeah, the 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 flighty flighty stuff is tough. Yeah, flowy things are are, are yeah. I don't like it. And I wanted it. I, I wanted it to have a kind of iridescent, uh, iridescenty, rainbowy kind of flavor. After Tom mentioned dragonfly wings, but I went for a bit more of like a mist, a misty rainbow distortiony. Yeah, it's like the refraction kind of thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like a cloud cape. Yeah, kind of like it's exactly. And, yeah, and fluffy. I actually like how it looked at this stage here, where I kind of put in that gradient and mm. let the highlights poke through a bit. It is cool, but I think it it matches the description better when it's done. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like I, I like the blue and the purple and the green together, but yeah, I mean, you were right to keep going. So she has those fingers missing from her glove. Did you mention that again? Was that she cut yeah. those off herself? Yeah, because she has high dexterity, right. so she trimmed those off, so right, right. she can do stuff. Which, it's um, it, those would be her uh, her drawing hand mm. like, for the bow. Um, but I almost kind of like the motif of that. Like you know, archers will wear gloves specifically on those fingers, so she's kind of wearing the opposite. Oh yeah. But I I, I like the idea of her being such a. But like there being something about her wood elfness and her being such a good hunter that she mm. wants to feel every little twang in the string. Yeah, like letting go of like even like that instant or whatever. It's like it's like no no, you're missing the best part, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Like they would be able to like that would matter. That yeah, exactly. Part. There's one thing I learned about recently that I'm just been dying to incorporate into a design, but I think it was uh Korean uh, uh, archery ring. It's oh like a, yeah, the yeah, thumb ring the thumb thing. Ring, like yeah. that. Like to me, that just that was just so clever and cool. Mm -hmm. Man, I never would have thought of that, but I've yeah. been dying for the first chance to use <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Well, shoot, we'll have to race because I like those two. Okay. Well, I've got the uh, YouTube <laughs> channel, so. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I was thinking like one thing that I've tried to impress on students a bit, like just sort of. <laughs> when I'm feeling ranty is so many people those younger people especially like kind of starting off they kind of they doubt the value of research or like they don't really know how valuable it really is and the way that I try to explain it is that like humans since there's been humans have always been humans uh, they've just been they've been just as intelligent just as clever and just as capable Mm. Um, and they've lived in every scenario that a human can sort of imagine. 
that is like possible for a human to imagine. They've lived from primitive times to modern times to cities and jungles and deserts and north poles and you know equators and mountains and valleys and whatever and swamps and coasts and every scenario you could ever think of deep mm-hmm. woods whatever and they've all found over centuries and millennia their own solutions to real problems yeah and if you're working in fictional worlds that have gravity mm-hmm. <laughs> and light and biological beings that eat and breathe and die there's going to be enough overlap between that world and how it behaves and this world and how it behaves mm-hmm. that they're going to need that the people in the fictional world would have whether they're human or elf or dwarf or whatever they're going to have come across their own solutions to these things yeah. and just sort of like um like like it would be like a parallel sort of thing where you know it's like the arm you know like the bat wing and the human arm you know it's mm-hmm. a similar structure just manifested different ways yeah right and so it's going to be like that sort of crossover. And so if you have characters in a medieval, like a Western medieval fantasy world, a great place to find out solutions to problems about clothing, armor, weapons, agriculture, smithing, whatever, there's going to be a huge plethora of historical sources for, 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 uh, for people that are similar enough to what you need to see how they solve those problems. Yes. And it doesn't mean, like, like the thing that I, I never want people to do with, like, reference and, and inspiration is, like, kind of what I call, like, like fruit salad, where they just, like, that happens a lot with creature design, where it's, like, they cut off the head of a lion, they cut mm-hmm. off the tail of a scorpion, and they put it together. And it's not like, you're not taking, like, Roman sword and Anglo-Saxon hood and just putting it on one character. Mm-hmm. But it's like, okay, I can see that the hood is valuable because of these reasons, but it's for an elf in Faerun or whatever in Faerun mm-hmm. realms so it's going to have this sort of pattern this material this stitching it's going to be in this condition yeah, yeah. and then you, you translate that solution into the fictional world in a way that fits but yeah so yep, that's absolutely a, that's kind of my rant on like reference and stuff like i guess that the cherry on top of it all is like don't be inspired by games <laughs> or movies you know yeah. like <clears throat> those shouldn't be your inspiration for concept art or like what what's what would be a good idea because you should look at what the people who made that stuff look at you should look at go like, a few layers deep in, ref- in you gotta go back further down that tree well because even uh, like we've been looking at a lot of um uh for a while now we've anytime you see eh, we've been looking at a lot of old film yeah. language like just because a lot of old black and white movies had fantastic composition and yeah and they'd create such strong uh, go watch the third man if you haven't if you haven't seen that it's an old it's like iconic film noir um stuff but they use such incredible compositions and shapes and and you know it's modern movies are still kind of copying that and working from it and and you just keep going back and going back and and for inquisition we referenced a lot of northern renaissance stuff and it was just you see so much good good stuff back there but you realize that every cool thing you see they had took inspiration from something Mm -hmm. and they took inspiration from something and they took inspiration from something so so much more worthwhile i think to go back to not it's not like there's a source necessarily but like go back to as far down as you can before the idea got chewed up by so many people well it's inbreeding in a way well and, and like we got to a point a little bit on, you know, for a while we were talking about, trying to talk about um, storyboards. And there were some people that just, every every meeting, they, they kept coming up with all of their references were to Star Wars. Yeah. And it was like, okay, well, let's, let's talk about some other movies. Let's talk about some other stuff that, you know, there, there were other films that used different language and, and mm-hmm. things outside of that. Um, that, yeah, you need to make sure that you're, you're looking at, <laughs> everything i mean i okay i'll, I'll say now i have uh, on my tumblr i follow i've been very particular about casting a very very wide net as far as what i follow mm. um so anytime i need just like a a shot of inspiration i'll go and scroll down for like a page but i'm following everything from uh, there are some blacksmiths some glass blowers woodworkers leather workers 
um, some ballet troops that do stuff, some modern interpretive, like contemporary dance troops that do stuff. Um, I follow like LARPing blogs of people who go out and it's, especially the ones mm -hmm. from Northern Europe. They're amazing. Um, I follow video game art. I follow pulp art, mm -hmm. um, old movie posters, uh, people who do film stills, um, there's uh, some zoology blogs that just do purely just animal stuff. Some that are nothing but old illustrations of animals. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just it, the widest possible net so that you're hitting all sorts of weird stuff you'd never think of. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a bronze sculpture of a child and then suddenly you're looking at um, uh, a, th a theater company's set design for a gas station. Mm -hmm. that was cleverly done and then you're looking at you know a series of photos of of uh beautifully sculpted manhole covers and all of these things and they just kind of like push through your brain then you filter stuff out and and it just i think even just being reminded of how broad and crazy the world is yeah it keeps you from limiting yourself it keeps you like every time you think is this too far Mm -hmm. It's just if you have enough re reference and, and inspiration in you, then the answer is always no, no, that's not too far. Well, and if you can, if you can't remember all this stuff, like if, all this stuff that you can learn, it, the hope my hope would be that it, it would at least keep your brain limber enough that you're like, okay, wait, this I could push this more. Like I know that the world is mm -hmm. like you might not be able to be like, oh yeah, I remember like what some good reference would be like that sword hilt I saw in DeviantArt a few months ago. <clears throat> Yeah. Or like that, like Roman kneecap that I saw, like yeah, like in April or something. But just to have that broader sense of like, okay, I can push this stuff really far. Yeah. Like if you're doing a lot of creature designs, the more you know about what kind of animals are out there, mm -hmm. the more comfortable you are with taking liberties on things or pushing stuff. Further. Yeah. You know, still keeping it within the bounds of biology. Yeah. But I I would say that is like one of the number one crimes I see in portfolios is not going far enough mm. is people being too safe mm -hmm. people obviously not drinking from a deep enough well and they're just doing the same robot you've seen a million times yeah you, like yep i've totally seen that that's mm -hmm. well well trod and you know but the the people who are, are researching crazy stuff and it's like why would you build a robot like that but it's so cool and exciting and challenging and and it, it you know pushes the limits of mm -hmm. of how you define this stuff uh, yeah i just i get really excited by that yeah like when you see somebody who's pushing stuff you you kind of it comes with the mundane stuff the typical stuff like you know that they could do that if you had to yeah. Like if a if a boring project came down the pipe and they were on your team, you knew like, okay, yeah, we can we could handle that, no problem. But mm -hmm. but the people that reach further well can also reach really near them well. Yeah. And like the, yeah, so I think that would be good. I mean there's so there's like just a little over seven and a half minutes. Mm hmm Um I think maybe a good thing to do would be if you had maybe any advice. I mean, that comes up a lot, but uh I think, I mean, like, for somebody who want, if somebody wanted to become a concept artist, mm -hmm. what, what would be some good things they should be aware of heading forward? Well, I think we've touched on a few of them already. Like the research thing is huge. You can't underestimate yeah. that. Um, the and it's boring. Like, like the research <laughs> and stuff. Like it's... you'll watch a lot of documentaries that'll put you to sleep. Yep. Um, you got it. You got to love it past the hate threshold you know like you got to be bored you got to oh, yeah. you got to yep. draw till your hand hurts put some ice on it and then keep drawing yeah uh you got to read encyclopedias you got to like just yeah anyway so, mm -hmm. you, know, you you answer it no you, I'm, you, I, I, no i'm your, uh, that's exactly it that's, yeah uh, that's all it um well i like i, I tried i think i was able to break it down for someone once and i think it's true it's just concept art is just clever ideas drawn well Yep, and if that's you can, it. If you, and you get clever ideas from learning about nature, biology, and the universe. Mm -hmm. Learning everything you can. Don't. There's not a set list. Just go out and learn. Your own interests will guide you to what you need to know. Yeah, and then being able to draw it well, like or at least to a communicable level. So like drapery, like you said, anatomy, yeah. which is kind of like what I want to, what I would love to be like the master of, and then. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and then like rendering form, like painting, doing like still lives and stuff. Yeah. And those two things, if you, yeah, so if you can broaden and also uh, depth and deepen, deepen your, <laughs> deepen your well of ideas. Um, in depth and in depth and eyes, <laughs> the amount of your like your pool of, uh, of of ideas and your knowledge of the world in every way, and then yeah, I think it's a, it's something that <clears throat> you got to be curious. Like every yep. every concept artist I've ever met has just been like a normal person who knows a lot about stuff and loves trivia <laughs> and reads on their lunch breaks mm -hmm. or watches like documentaries. Mm -hmm. or, like, like how to videos on yeah. YouTube and lunch. They're and stuff. greedy for the world. Yeah, they're yeah, they're absolutely just greedy. They're just desperate for information. Yeah. And <clears throat> I that that pretty much covers the the, the biggest one. Um, there's one thing that I've been fond of say, of telling people now um, that I, you know, I, I I would have wanted to be told this young. I I think I would live this way anyway, but um, it's if you want to be doing this for a living, you want to be making concept art, you want to be pushing forward, um, you have to sacrifice that one thing that's taking away from your drawing time. Mm. And I say it this way on purpose, that I don't know what that thing is, but you probably just thought of it when I said that. And so whether that's the amount of TV you're watching or browsing Reddit or... Um, Video games themselves. Video games themselves, or whatever, whatever it is, um, you kind of have to start sacrificing that stuff in order to just make space for it. That that um, most of the concept artists that I know who are working professionally, they come from all sorts of different backgrounds. They have different experiences. It's never the same story, except that they love this stuff so much that they gave up a life in order to do it. And, I, you know, I always add that, that you can have a life. It's just that comes after. Yeah. That, like, you need to pour yourself into it so hard that you're the weirdo, that that people hesitate to invite you to parties because, oh, he's going to bring that book. You know, like, it's, you, you just, you want it to be to the point where family and friends almost want to stage an intervention that maybe you're putting too much focus on this drawing thing. Yeah. Like that's kind of the right amount. Yeah, like doesn't um, he have a doesn't she have a backup plan? You know, yeah, like people like, should ask that question. And you know, I'd I'd say I'd add to you you still wanna you have to keep attention on the other aspects of your life. You know, if your if your health is failing, that's gonna affect your drawing. Um, keep you know, keep the important relationships in your life going because they'll help you through, they'll encourage you, they'll they'll, you know, keep you going through this stuff. But there's a certain ferocity that's necessary to to pursue this stuff. Uh, like I say, like yeah. Yeah. ferocity is a, a good word for it. I think, like my opinion is that concept artist is probably the most coveted job in Western civilization. <laughs> Every kid loves video games. Every kid wants to make video games. Every kid, when they say they want to make video games, it's not until they're older that they they'll admit that they want to be a programmer. But when they start off, they want to draw the monsters they want to draw the heroes they want to draw the weapons and come up with neat guns and swords and it's the job that comes to mind first for like every <laughs> kid aside from like biologists and, and stuff like that but but you got to acknowledge that like artist it, and biologist that's those are the it's ones. a it's competitive yeah like there's an army of people outside every studio wanting to get in mm -hmm. and you have to it has to show in your work yeah that you have that that fire mm -hmm. that, that fire in the belly yeah that uh yeah that um i think that if it, just specifically to aspiring artists that um if you know your portfolio should be like you should be working towards making work that any company could look at your work and they can imagine sit this person down at a desk and go yeah that you know, we want what they're doing and we want them, we want them now that I know that's, that's not, that's not a specific thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, be a visual storyteller, do your reference, do your research, always, always, always practice the fundamentals. And, uh, I think Just draw till it hurts, and draw then, till it hurts. And then keep I actually did that when I started a bio where I drew, I was drawing so much at work and I draw at home that for the first two months, my drawing hand ached. 
Mm. And I couldn't shake it. And I was worried. I visited the doctor, but eventually I built up my stamina. And now it's fine. But I, yeah. So yeah, there she is, Clara. That's yeah, great. I hope yeah. that was helpful and well, yeah. illuminating. And it well, was fun uh, just to goof around and talk about this stuff because we can talk about it forever. Yeah, and I think it'd be really good to have another video where we can go even more depth into advice and input and stuff on becoming a concept artist. Maybe mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of rants that could be involved in that. But uh, every time artists get together, this is what we talk about. Yeah. Yep. For hours. <laughs> um, in but circles. yeah. Uh, Thanks again for doing this, Matt. This is a really good, good, good thing that happened. With Thank you, you for letting me stink up your channel. I hope you get to do it again. Me too. And um, we've still got a few seconds left. But anyway, yeah. So this was for the free weekly character art lottery. To learn more to join in, just go to R and D Fantasy on Twitter, and the lotteries on uh, Mondays. And I just I draw your D and D characters for free. Sometimes I get guest artists like Matt. Um, and it was a joy having him. Hope it helped.